Good morning and welcome to our live broadcast at First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to come into your home today with good news about God who loves you. We are located in beautiful Uptown Columbus on the corner of 11th and 1st. We would love for you to join us for worship or just stop by and say hello. At First Presbyterian Church, we welcome you with grace and gratitude for God's love. Listen to these words as they may speak to you today where you find yourself. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and all those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We are continuing on in uh, the book of Ephesians. This is Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. We were in chapter four last week. We're moving to chapter five this week. We are reading from chapter five, verses six through 14. That is six through 14. Listen now for the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be associated with them. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord you are light. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week, and I know you all remember because you were here and you haven't been able to stop thinking about it since last Sunday, I know. We were also in Ephesians. We were in the chapter before. And so kind of to take the big step backward a little bit to remind ourselves of the context. Ephesians, we think, was written by Paul. He came to Ephesus for a short time in his first missionary journey, established the church, came back, stayed for three years in his second journey, and got the church in Ephesus, uh, continued to grow. And the reason he came back and stayed so long is also one of the focuses of Ephesus, and that's unity. So we have Jews, we have Gentiles. Think about those Jews who have spent their whole life, generations, spent in what they know as to be the Jewish faith. And now there's something different going on. They're being told that Messiah has come, and now they need to respond to that. And they're thinking, how? Well, wait, he was, he's one of us. He was Jewish. So what part of my faith do I bring in here or not at all? Or is it connected or how is it not? That's the Jewish struggle. Then you have the Gentiles on the other side, the pagans, the non-believers, those who have never been 
a part of the house of Israel, those in that area that worship so many other false, different gods, which would be us before Christ. And so they're trying to figure out and be in the same church with this other group that's trying to figure out how to bring in what they know to be faith. Pagans and Gentiles bringing in all that they knew and their multiple gods if they believed anything at all. And they're here together under one church trying to be one church family. Boom. So Paul comes back and has to stay a while. I'm glad by now we've been able to work out all differences within the church and that was just a thing of the past. Ha uh ha. -huh. But just like they did in that church, we bring our context with us everywhere we go. Why? Because it's who we are. Our past is our past. Our present is our present. Our lives are our lives. Even if we were all to have been Presbyterians and grown up in the Presbyterian church, which I know we didn't, and that's okay. It only makes us richer and more diverse. But even if we were, we would still sit down in here together and have disagreements over scripture, theology, social issues, politics in the world, all the things that seek to divide us. And yet, Paul was saying to them then, you know what, some of that's important and we need to visit that, but what's more important than where you've been, what's more important than how you have practiced or even what you have believed, moving forward, what's more important is Christ. That we are united together. That doesn't mean we don't have disagreements. It doesn't mean we don't bring in who we are in our past. Unity is not uniformity. We can be a church family and have different thoughts on things. Should be able to. And yet there are thousands of Christian offshoots and denominations and churches for the reason that we continue to find it. So that's what Paul's dealing with in Ephesus, and it's what we continue to deal with on a daily basis in our current culture. So last week, if you remember, one of the big themes of last week was Paul's words, we are members of one another. Paul, so steeped in community, so steeped in church and the group, that everything Paul did was about the church family, about the church community. We are members of one another. And so hard. Because if I'm a member of you and you're a member of me, that means the things I do affect you and the things you do affect me. We often think, well, I just if, if I'm doing, if I'm choosing darkness over light, if I'm choosing complacency over faith, it's just going to affect me, but it's, it's not. As a church family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we affect one another. All members of one another. That's hard. We know that's the right answer, but making that happen is such a challenge. Loving your neighbor as yourself? Come on, who can do that? I love myself pretty good. Do I love you the same way? Well, I try, but you're not always there. I'm always with me. So members of one another, we are locked, we are bound. Desmond Tutu's idea of Ubuntu is that same idea. My life is caught up with your life and yours with mine. So then it goes down last week again and says, these are some things that will lead you away from God and one another, and here are some things that will lead you closer to God and one another. So here we pick up in our passage today, and as Debbie said, one of the, the greatest symbols that repeats throughout Old Testament, New Testament, and that is darkness versus light. Continued from day one of creation on through the resurrection and the Pentecost into Revelation. Darkness and light as an understanding of being with God in Christ and the Holy Spirit or being apart. 
central and continues to be repeated again and again. Paul lifts this up so that we will understand as family, as community of Christ, that we are to be people of light. Yay, light. We like light. How do we do that? Easier said than done, as is so many things in our lives. Great bumper stickers out there in the world, but so much of it hard to practice and bring to fruition. Being children of light. Well, that means, to a certain degree, very simply, that when we follow... That when we are loving one another, again, because we are all connected, there is no faith alone on an island by ourselves. Although God is with you, should you wash up on an island and you're a castaway, God is there with you, God loves you. But the design is that we have one another as a gift to help one another, to challenge one another, to keep each other accountable, to go into dark places together as bearers of Christ's light, to places that are more challenging to do as individuals. The gift is the community of faith. Gosh, I would want to do this on my own. We can do so much together and so much more together, and we know that. But we have to be willing to work with one another. Again, here the focus, Jews and Gentiles. Maybe here it's Democrats and Republicans. Uh-oh. I did it. I did it. Those who were pro this and anti that. Those who voted this way and that. We've been given gift, we've been given faith and gifts by the Holy Spirit. That we said that earlier. When we use them, and this passage talks about being a child of light and bearing fruit. So again, another repeated biblical image is bearing fruit, which really means that you can tell from the outside without having known who each of us is, that if we are bearing fruit for Christ, you will be able to see that. If you remember Christ cursed the fig tree, what, what does Christ spending his time and power with his wrath on shrubbery, what, what, what is the point of that? The point of that is that that tree was a fruit tree and it was made to bear fruit. And it wasn't. And in the same way, we are like that tree meant to be in ministry for Christ. And people should be able to look at our lives and see it without us having to tell them. You could look at a fig tree without fruit and you could say, what kind of tree is that? I don't know. If you see a, fruit, a fig, then you know. We bear fruit for Christ, and people should be able to see that in our world. What have you done with Christ? What have you done for Christ? What have we done together as a church community? It should be observable. Others should be able to see that. Big example. You, you've been surrounded, so I won't take too much time, but we lost Aretha. Thursday, Aretha Franklin. Amazing. Her gifts for ministry. I never knew all of the ways that she was plugged in in so many places to so many people and so foundational to so many. Born March 25th, 1942. She was born in Memphis, but spent most of her life in Detroit at her father's church, New Bethel Baptist Church, where he was, by all accounts, a, a powerful and well-respected preacher. So much so, and, and her mother, although she died when she was 10, was a vocalist and a pianist. And so from her parents early on, she had both the, the religious faith side and the music present. And so she had this steady stream of people coming through her house that were both musicians, famous gospel musicians of the day, and also political figures of the day. People like Mahalia Jackson, who was involved both with gospel, also with the civil rights movement. 
Dr. King, Martin Luther King, came through, stayed at their house. She was exposed to this growing up. I never knew any of this until she died, which as an aside is a shame. There's got to be a way that we can celebrate one another's journey before we're toes up in the casket. And we say, oh, I never knew they did that. I never knew he did that. I never knew she did that. We ought to be able to celebrate each other's journey now. Y'all get to work on that. We'll handle that another time. So throughout the 60s, she really begins to bloom when she's 18, signs record deals. She had a difficult life. She had several marriages. She was a victim of domestic violence. Four boys, children. But one of the best of all time. She sold 75 million records. That's a lot. She was top of the charts in Billboard's 100. She's the most charted female artist ever. She was in several top 100 artists and vocalists of all time. One of those, she was number nine. 1987, she was the first female to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. 1987. For some of you, that is a world and a lifetime ago. That was the year I graduated from high school. I don't see that as the dark ages. But no woman before that in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, she was the first. I didn't know that respect had come to be a civil rights and feminist song of support and unity. Why? Well, I never studied her life before. I thought I knew, but I didn't. Amazing. So many people in so many different areas of life. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of tweets with you. John Legend said she was the greatest vocalist I've ever known. Elton John, the loss of Aretha Franklin is a blow to everybody who loves real music. Music from the heart, the soul, and the church. Her voice was unique. Her piano playing underrated. She was one of my favorite pianists. Donald Trump, current president of these United States. The queen of soul, Aretha Franklin, is dead. She was a great woman with a wonderful gift from God, her voice. She will be missed. And on the other side, president, former President Obama. She helped define the American experience. In her voice, we could feel our history, all of it and in every shade. Our power in our pain, our darkness in our light, mm -hmm, thank you. Our quest for redemption and our hard-won respect. Wow. I didn't know the whole church side, Aretha. I knew that's where she started. But in hearing her current pastor, Robert Smith Jr. at New Bethel, apparently she never strayed too far from her church. For her, that order was God, church, and her father, the pastor. Where are my girls? I don't think I have a shot. And her pastor said that no matter what she did or where she sang, even the Star Spangled Banner, you could see and feel the church in it. Isn't that great? No matter what she sings, if she's a completely secular event, completely secular music, whatever she does, you, she, you can see the church in it. That is fruit. That we can see the Christ in one another, even if we're not doing churchy things. Even if we are out in the world and we don't necessarily have Christ as a common point, and even if we do, we need to be able to be seen and put out there those gifts, that light of Christ, so that others will be able to say, gosh, everything he does, I see Christ in him. I see church 
in what he or she does. At the end of our lives, we will go through our obituaries and it'll say where we went to school, where we married, maybe our kids, some interests of ours. But I'm telling you, if we get to the point, and those, those are all great accomplishments, I'm not downplaying that. But what really seems to make a difference as one who will be speaking your words at your service, or maybe you mine, are the ways that you help other people, and I help other people. The way that you have used your faith so that others will be able to see that starts in the home with your family, your cousins, your parents, your children, your extended family, and moves out into the community. Oh yeah, we knew he was a person of faith. We knew she was a person of faith. And they never assaulted us with the Bible or told us we were going to hell if we didn't believe what they believed but we could see it. They bore fruit and we could tell. That is our call today. To bear that fruit, to have the courage to stand and to go to dark places as bearers of Christ's light. Easier said than done, I know. But again, we have the gift of one another so we can go to hard and dark places. We don't have to do it ourselves, but sometimes we are called to. Every day you have opportunities that you pass on or that you seize. Our call today is to wake up, sleeper awake, Paul says. And it's not plural, it's as if it is to each one of us. Wake up. It's not too late. Raise from the dead and Christ's light will shine on you. The same way that Martin Luther, German monk started, we refer to as the Protestant Reformation. Every day he would remember his baptism when he splashed water in his face. Every day that you wake up from your sleep in your bed, Say to yourself, I am waking up, I am rising with Christ, and pray for Christ's light to shine on you and in you. You are never too old to wake up, to rise. You are never too young. You are never too bad or never too good. Every day we rise up into Christ or we don't. So today, as we remember Aretha and her amazing vocal and musical gifts, we also remember how she never left her church in Detroit, how she often cared for those in that church and her community, because that's what you do when you follow Christ as a child of light. And Paul says, no matter what our differences, the light of Christ is more important and can and will unify us. So let us all awake, rise with Christ, and seek to be bearers of his light in the world. Hallelujah. Amen.